So, so the so the last talk is uh, is the KPZ fixed point. So, uh, what we got last time is we started uh, we, we we got a formula for k step starting from essentially any initial data and rescaled it and got a formula for what you would see. Uh, in the limit, as epsilon goes to zero, rescaling the height function at time t. And so we give a formula for these sort of generalized area processes, right? What you get what you start with general initial data. Okay. Um, so what I want to do today is sort of describe all the properties of this thing. And the first thing we want to is, is some sort of regularity. So regularity. Okay, so, so the first thing we want to do is uh, just, you know, check how, how rough is this function. And, of course, the answer is the function is going to look locally like a Brownian motion. So it's going to be roughly the same as a Brownian motion. And so the natural thing to measure that in is these uh, Helder norms. So the Helder beta norm. And now, now we want to make it local, so we'll just look on minus m to m. M is just some finite box, and you just take the supremum of x1 not equal to x2 of, uh, you know, in M1 minus M, M of uh, hx1 minus hx2 over x1 minus x2 to the beta. Okay, so that's the local Helder norm. And, and roughly what you expect is uh, it to be in this with uh, beta. Uh, anything less than a half, like Brownian motions. Okay. So, so the so what happens is, is we have the following result um, for any for any t positive. So for any for any initial data h zero in U C. Remember U C is it's upper semi continuous functions with this Hausdorff topology, local Hausdorff topology, uh, and uh, any any t positive um, and any finite m, uh, the limit as a goes to infinity of the probability that the solution at time t, this local holder, that's beta minus m, m uh, very equal to a is equal to zero, and that's for any beta less than half, which I forgot to write. Okay. So just to think, how would you prove such a thing? Well, the way you prove such things in general is this uh, Kolmogorov condition. So you Kolmogorov continuity theorem. That's our main tool for proving the regularity of stochastic processes. It's an amazing theorem, which basically tells you the two-point function tells you the regularity of your, of your function. So basically, roughly, it says that if you can control um, Of a bound like this, basically you get uh, Helder uh, B over A. That's 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 what the Komarov continuity theorem tells you, and um, and so the amazing thing is you just need the two points. You just need two point functions of your of your stochastic process to tell you how regular that thing is. It, Completely amazing theorem. Okay. So, I guess I'll just write out um, our formula again. So, how, how would you do this? Well, I want two point functions. I'll write it out for m point functions just so that, because I want to use it in a second. 
So this is just a rewriting of our formula. this H. So, so H here is just the asymptotic limit of the TASEP height field under the 1, 2, 3 scaling at time t. That's all we know so far. And it's given by a determinant. Now, th the way I wrote it before, I wrote it H less than some general function is equal to determinant of I minus K hypo K epi. But I'll write it a little bit, a little bit more explicitly right now. Because we actually want just m points, right? So. When you're establishing this continuity, do you need to work with the preasymptotic object to show that you actually have a continuous process in the limit? Yes. If you just did that, okay. <laughs> I was going to say that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, sure. Let's let's go step by step. Yeah. So here's an extended kernel formula for the thing. So now, now this is on the extended space. So this is L2 of uh, you know, x1 through xm. That set times r. OK, so that's an extended kernel version of our formula. As I was saying, you have extended kernel versions, and you have path integral versions. There's just all these different ways to write the formula. Since we only want to be less than the values at m different places, you basically can just write this k epi of those m different upside down narrow wedges and just compute, and you're going to get a formula like this, where, where this kt extended, okay, hypo. Sorry, these formulas are a little bit long, but anyway. If you think about it, the formulas are about as simple as they could be. E to the xj minus xi d squared xi less than xj um, plus e to minus xi d squared k t hypo. Okay, so these are all uh, heat operators. Some of them are some of the heat operators are backwards in time, but as we saw, our old KT hypo is full of airy kernels, airy functions which allow you to apply backwards heat kernels. So, th so this is a legal object, and that's the extended kernel. Or you could write this thing in path integral formulation like this. Okay, hypo. M plus K. That's just I plus and then chi bar. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to e to the x1 minus x m d squared chi bar p1. At any rate, all I'm doing is writing out the uh, path integral version of the same formula, because we know we can go back and forth between the two. So you don't even need to know the details of this. OK, so there's a path integral version, which is now just on L2 of R. OK. OK, so at any rate, I'm just showing you some, some multi-point formulas for this height function at some time t. And um, we only need two-point formulas. And the only thing I want to point out is that what happens, and it's kind of a surprise, is that if you look at the two-point version of this, it's extremely hard to prove something like this. But if you look at the two-point version of this, it's actually very easy. All you have to do is a little trace class estimate on the two-point thing here, and it comes out clean. Okay? I'm not going to do it for you. but. 
you get an estimate of this nature, and that proves, that's how you prove that the thing's held there. So, so these, these path integral versions turn out to be extremely useful for things like this. For some reason, it's easier to read off this kind of information from them. The small scale information, when points are close to each other, turns off to be much easier to read off the path integral version than off the extended kernel versions. It's just the way things are. Okay. Another thing you get out of this for free, and for free means I think everybody here can imagine doing the calculation. So I think you can all imagine you have the two-point function here, you plug this thing in, and you actually just start computing. Okay. I think you can also imagine that you wouldn't want to watch me do it for the next 45 minutes. Um, but you can also imagine that if you now, scale, now zoom in on the, on the function, okay? So if you zoom in on the function, what you're doing is you're just, you, you pick some point, XM, and now you make all these guys really small, okay? And zoom in locally on the function, and you'll see that the thing's a Brownian motion. Because the kernels just converge as you zoom in to a beautiful kernel which gives you Brownian motion. And it's just immediate when you do the calculation. Okay. So you get that the things, so what you get out of this is that it's a, uh, Helder, and it's also locally Brownian. So it's, so it's Helder. Yeah, so the, the sense that I'm talking about is I, I, I look at a point, and I look at the differences. So H, I, look at, I fix a T, and I look at H, T, X plus Y minus H, T, uh, X. So I look at this function of y. And as you zoom in and rescale out, okay, so you look at epsilon to the minus, epsilon to the minus a half h of epsilon y converges to a Brownian motion. It's, it's, it's a local version of being locally Brownian. In terms of finite dimensional distributions. In terms of finite dimensional distributions. Yeah, but it wouldn't be hard to prove it was tight. So. It's fine. Do you get absolute continuity? No, no, you don't get absolute continuity from this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what Ivan's pointing out is there's, there's, there's different notions of these processes being um, locally Brownian, and this is perhaps the weakest notion of those. Okay? As you zoom in, you're going to see a Brownian motion. Another one is that if you looked on some interval, this process would actually be absolutely continuous with respect to a Brownian motion. That's not something you get from these formulas. That, but it, that is something that you get from uh, your, your uh, the Corwin, oh, <laughs> that's right, oh, I'm sorry. So, so Corwin and Hammond can prove that the Airy 2 process is absolutely continuous with respect to a, a Brownian motion on a finite interval, which is a stronger statement than this, okay? So that's, now, that's not known for these other processes now. And I don't think it's known for any other case, right? Yes, I, I, I guarantee you it's true that for any initial data, this thing is on finite intervals absolutely continuous with respect to Brownian motion. Can you prove things like the unique R max in an interval? Yes. I'll tell you after how to prove it. <laughs> so, so Ivan's question was whether <laughs> there's a property which we're, it's very interesting to compute the arg maxes of these things because that's where the polymers end up. Okay? There's an underlying polymer model which just wants to go to the arg max. And so you'd like to know that that arg max is unique. So that's something that was a problem to prove even for the ARI process a while ago. But one would be able to prove it here too U using these formulas. Okay, so some things the formulas are good for and some perhaps not. Okay, luckily. So, so it's locally brown. But now, now there's a bigger question, um, and that's that uh, we actually don't know this thing's a markup process. Not yet, I mean, in, in this discussion. 
So how do you prove it's a Markov process? Well, of course you could say, well, I took it as the limit of, of the TASEF height functions and their Markov process. Isn't the limit of a Markov process? Should be a Markov process, right? Is that true? It's not true. It's the limit of a Markov process. Exercise. Make yourself a counterexample. If you don't know one, you should know one. It's false. And the Markov property, the Markov property is basically the chapman kolmogorov equations. So the chapman kolmogorov equations here would read PH0, HS, this is in DF. F, H, T, that's what I call the G, is equal to P, H, 0, H, T plus S, that's what I call the G. That would be the Markov property. That's the chapman kolmogorov grove equations. But you might imagine this is going to be a little bit difficult to prove, because this integration is the integration over U, C. Right? It's a nightmare. And we definitely do not have a formula for this. So that's hopeless. So the only way you're going to be able to prove the Markov property of this thing at this point is to prove it's a Markov process because it's the limit of Markov process in a nice way. And that you need some sort of tightness. So here's a lemma. Well, it's P epsilon T X A. Uh, th these guys are a Markov process, and they're Feller. It's a Feller Markov transition probabilities. Okay. And suppose they converge to Feller kernels. P, T, X, A are Feller kernels. Kernels just meaning their probability measures depending on X. But they're Feller. But you don't know they satisfy the Markov property, but P, Epsilon are converging to them. Then the kind of tightness you need is the following. So this is all on some polar space. <laughs> on polar space. State space S. OK. OK. And now for, for each T and each delta zero, there's a compact set, compact k delta, such that p epsilon t x k delta, no, it's a k delta, k delta complement is less than delta, and p epsilon t x a converge to p t x a uniformly x in k delta. Then <laughs> p is Markov. Yeah, yeah. Weak convergence of measures. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna. Okay. So, um, actually, once one has this lemma, and the lemma is it, lemma is a good exercise. Actually, if you if you like continuous probability, it's very easy to prove once you know what the lemma is. Um, yeah, yeah. A's are the subset in the you know they're the the Borel sets in S. Yeah. But of course, you can use a generating family and things like that. OK. The uniformity is just for fixed, each fixed A is uniform for all. Oh, oh, oh. 
So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's not get into a long discussion. You sit down and you can prove it in about, you can really literally prove this in about one minute once you know the statement. So the point is, is that we're done because these guys are feller. Everybody's feller, and the reason they're feller is because this map from F and G into these, into these operators, K hypo F, K epi G, is actually continuous in trace class. And that automatically makes these things feller because determinant is a continuous function of the trace norm of the kernel. And so we just got to find our k deltas. But k deltas are easy. These are k deltas. Well, the, the less than or equal to a are k deltas. OK? Can you explain again why they're feller? Are they fighting? Oh, they're all feller because the map from the initial data and the final g, if you like, to these operators, k hypo, k epi, is actually continuous in trace. It's a continuous map into the trace class. Change your initial data slightly. Yeah, exactly. And you can prove this. It's, 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 not, it's relatively straightforward to prove. Oh, of course, after a conjugation. There's a conjugation one has to do. OK. And so we've got our sets k delta, which are just the, the bounded sets of uh, Helder norm. They turn out to be nice compact sets in UC. OK. so it's a, it's, it's actually not hard to prove the Markov property. OK, so in other words, finally, we have the, our H. H is a feller Markov process. On UC. And it's really nice. It's an it's a integrable in the sense that it's Transition probabilities are explicit in some sense, and um, it's scaling invariant. Invariant under H goes to epsilon one half, epsilon to the minus three halves t, epsilon to the minus one x. And the airy processes are special self similar solutions of this thing. process, so H0 of x is just equal to 0, then HT of x is nothing but T to the 1 third, the area 1 process, T to the minus 2 thirds of x. And if H0x is a narrow wedge at 0 or anywhere, Draw like that. Does everyone know what I mean? It's, it's the function which is 0 at 0 and minus infinity elsewhere, which is a function in our space. Then uh, htx is t of 1 third, area 2 hat, t to the minus 2 thirds x. And remember, the hat just means you subtract a parabola from the area process. And if h 0x is equal to this upper semi-continuous function, a wedge. So that just means the function which is 0 to the right and minus infinity to the left. Then htx is t to the 1 third times the process called area 2 to 1, t to the minus 2 thirds x. And I just want to quickly describe the calculation to get that. So how do we know this? Well, you, you actually go into the formula and check that it's exactly that. So I, I'm going to show you this one a tiny bit, or a sketch of this one. So in the first class, we actually saw the extended kernel formula for the finite dimensional distributions of this thing. And the way you get them is 
Well, I just plug that function in and try to calculate the k hypo. So k hypo is built out of s bar t 0 hypo of h 0. Now, if you remember, that thing is just calculated by calculating the starting from some point. Maybe I'll write it out. Um, uv is equal to expectation starting from v um, s t 0 of uh, x, s t uh, minus tau of b tau u. OK. And here it's hypo, so, so v starts above the curve. Anyway, don't worry about that too much. At any rate, um, now, oh, and, and there's, there's one for plus and there's one for minus. So you go one way and you do this hypo, and you go the other way and you do this hypo. Now, this, this function is particularly easy because if you go, if you take st hypo minus, that's the easiest one of all, there's nothing to hit. You start above, there's just nothing to hit. There's things at minus infinity. What are you going to do? There's nowhere to hit. And so tau is just infinity. And you can easily check that s t minus infinity from the formula for s. Remember, if the s, s is just you know, this t to the one third airy process of, you know, airy function of, it's a very explicit function. And you can easily check that s t minus infinity is 0. So this thing is just 0. Just 0. Well, what about the other way? The other way you're starting by, I mean, you have to hit a line. So it's just the same thing, but you have to hit a line. I'm go over here. Just so you have those things to look at. So now, S T zero bar hypo hypo, sorry, h0 plus. <laughs> OK, so that just means I'm starting up here, and I, wanna, I have to hit this line, right? I have to hit the hypograph of this guy. But you just do that by the reflection principle, right? It's easy to calculate the time at which a Brownian motion hits a line. So you, and you, so you know the hitting density. And the hitting density is just. OK, so if I start at y, so I wrote it at y, the hitting density is just 0 to infinity. And, and now I'm, I'm going to give you, a, this is a ex very explicit calculation. d tau, tau is the hitting. Um, y, y is where you started, over 4 pi square root tau to the 3 halves, e to the minus y squared over 4 tau. So probably some of you calculated this in a course on Brownian motions. Okay? This is just the hitting time of a Brownian motion to a line. And you just compute it by the reflection principle. And now we have to integrate that against E. This one's really easy because B tau is just 0. 2 thirds tau cubed. And I'm, I'm taking t equals 0 here. So I'm, I'm taking, taking Sorry, t equals 1. Sorry, I'm taking t equals 1 just for the calculation. OK, because you can always rescale to get other t's. It's not a problem. Uh, t cubed minus tau of, of x. Very. So this is, the, this is this thing value, evaluated at x, y. Very function of x plus tau squared. OK, you get that. That's the interval you get. Okay? When you actually have to compute this thing. Here's something you might want to give to your calculus students. That's completely amazing. This is, I think, the most amazing formula I've ever seen. There's books of formulas for Aerie functions, which don't contain this formula. 
is really, really remarkable. It's extremely non-trivial fact. And that flip, that's the reflection which Daniel was talking about yesterday. So that means the kernel, when you do a, uh, a hypo of a line, is just a reflection. And now you put the reflection and the zero together, and all you do is write it down and you get the kernel, which I showed you guys the first class, just directly. You just, you just write it down. I'm not going to do it because it takes five minutes just to write, but there's nothing difficult. It's all because of this amazing fact. Okay. Nope. <laughs> what you do is you, you don't do it like this. You think of the thing using the reflection principle. You know, the reflection principle, you have this reflected point. And um, so, so you, solve, you, you basically are solving the heat equation with zero along, along the line by taking the solution of the heat equation minus its reflected value. Okay? And what you do is you compute each. And what this tells you is the reflected thing stays, and the non-reflected guy just goes to zero. And now you can just check. As, sorry, you, you know, you integrate from zero to L. And as L goes to infinity, the, the one that you started with just disappears. It's completely amazing. Okay. Okay, so now, so, so, so those are just some fun facts about the fixed point. Of course, there's lots more to prove. Um, let me point out a couple of things which, which aren't really in this picture. Not really in the picture. Because I don't want to give the impression that the KPZ fixed point is just the solution of everything. It's not. It's sort of the beginning of a lot of things. Um, random initial data. So I haven't been talking about that much for for a very important reason, that it, it's not really part of this picture. This says, I want to rescale out and I get a Markov process, but the Markov process should start from a deterministic initial data. But there are, of course, these amazing formulas for um, starting from two-sided Brownian motions or one-sided Brownian motions. And they don't really fit into this picture, because the only way you could fit them into the picture would be to integrate over that initial data. So you get a formula, which is our fixed point formula integrated over, take the expectation with respect to initial Brownian motion. But how are you going to solve that? So that's something that's kind of missing. Except that we checked, and if it's half 